Thanks to the LEGO Group for sponsoring today's video. Despite having over 1,000 hours in Communism Simulator, I've never 100%ed it. And the reason for that is that most of these things just take so long, oh my god. You need to ship every item in the game, max your friendships with all these disgusting credence, craft every item, cook every recipe, make 15 million gold, ship 15 of every crop, complete 40 help wanted requests, and the king of all uncompleted achievements, an ungodly horror risen from the depths of hell. Vector's Challenge. And today, I'm gonna start a brand new save file and complete every last one. Well, why, you ask? Clinical depression is a health condition that can affect anyone. And even though it's not technically required, I'm also gonna achieve perfection. So sit down and buckle up, because this ain't your parents' failing marriage. This is gonna be a long one. This is how I 100%ed all of Stardew Valley in just one save. I started off on day one doing the only professional Stardew skill I ever learned, clay farming. Now, if you don't know what clay farming is, I'm really happy for you, and I hope the grass feels nice. Clay farming is a skill invented by Stardew Valley pros, or as my mom calls them, losers, in which you hoe up tons of clay by predicting the space the next piece will spawn on. The in-depth explanation is pretty complicated, but all you need to know is that hoeing up clay is not random, but instead spawns in a pattern that shifts every time you hoe a single tile. By abusing this, I can hoe up tons of clay in a single day. Hoeing around on the beach takes a lot of energy, though. It's taking everything in my power to not make a joke here. So I head to Gus's and buy myself some juicy salads to restore my energy. After tilling up the entire beach, I've accumulated 3,120G. That taken care of and my parsnips planted and watered, I head to bed for the night. What a, are you joking? Are, uh, <laughs> what are the goddamn chances? <laughs> oh my god, seated, actually cheating. Oh my god. That is hilarious. This is great, as I can use these parsnips as energy to fuel more clay farming. On day three, I've actually farmed so much clay that I'm able to buy 45 copper ore from Clint and upgrade my pickaxe to copper. Meaning on day five, when the mines have finally opened up, I'm able to head in with a copper pickaxe. By leaving a chest at the lobby of the mines and dropping off my loot every five floors, I'm able to get a good amount of loot with no backpack upgrades. But unfortunately, floor six has been replaced with the average college apartment and is completely infested. That doesn't stop me though, as with all the sounds I was able to afford, I'm able to mine tons of copper Ore and get all the way down to floor 25 before passing out. And the next day, so we back in the mine. where I'm able to pick myself up an upgraded sword, dwarf scroll 2, and then progress all the way down to floor 59. Along the way, also make sure to kill any dust sprites we see, as the reward Gil gives you for killing 300 of them is going to be more important to this run than checking in on my Tamagotchi. Oh my god, it's dead again! Back to the video though, despite being just one floor away from the elevator, I'm defeated by perhaps the single most hated entity in all of Stardew Valley, the Spiral Floor. Yeah, there's no shot. Like this, though. Dang, that's so annoying. Oh, well. After a few more days of clay farming, I'm able to pick up our very first achievement, Greenhorn, for earning 15,000 G. Wow, just eight days in, I already got one. Maybe this will be a lot easier than I thought. Jesus Christ, on a bike. Oh my God, Jesus, get in the cab. With my newfound cash flow, I'm able to afford the iron pickaxe upgrade and head straight back to the mines. With the new power my pick provides, I'm able to head all the way down to floor 80 where I can body my true James W. Marshall. Get it? Because I'm farming gold. And James W. Marshall found gold at Sutter Mills in Coloma, California on January 24th, 1848. This news of gold brought approximately 300,000 people to California and caused the gold rush. Do you get it? Okay, I can't lie to you guys. I'm kind of just reading this off the Wikipedia page. Didn't mean to go full Summerton on you guys. My strategy here is just to keep resetting floor 81 by continually leaving and coming back to try and gather as much of that precious gold ore as I can. Luckily, this was made significantly easier as on floor 60, the remix mines dispense me a wooden mallet. This was a massive pickup as hammers and clubs are leagues above swords as their AOT attack can attack enemies multiple times as long as you just spam the left click. While I'm harvesting gold, I also make sure to grab any fire quartz I can find as these can be fired in the furnace for three refined quartz. In case you haven't caught on by now, I'm grinding out materials for quality sprinklers. As once the summer hits, I'm gonna plant fields of gold. However, just like paying my 70-year-old ex-wife alimony for the rest of my life, there was something I didn't plan for. You see, while I should have plenty of ore to craft the sprinklers, you don't actually unlock the recipe for quality sprinklers until farming level 6. And I've been spending so much time in the mines that I haven't planted a single crop. So just like Lisa did to make Lacey, it's time to start digging some clay. I feel like 
two people are gonna get that joke. The following day, I take my fat clay wand to Pierre's and buy an unusual spread of crops. Firstly, I buy 50 parsnip seeds, as we're gonna need the five gold star parsnips for the community center. The rest of my money I put into potato seeds, as of all the spring options, they're the most farming EXP to cost efficient. On day 13, I have earned 25,000 G, and I have Demetrius set up the mushroom cave. And if you're wondering why I don't choose the fruit bat cave, it's because my brain has yet to dissolve into goo and spill out of my ears. After that, I head to the egg festival, bust Jazz's feeble knee caps and grab myself the straw hat. The next day, I finally grab myself a frozen tear and thusly can finish the blacksmith bundle, unlocking the minecarts and finishing our first community center run. I buy a bunch of coal from the town insult as our daily mine strips have now amassed so much ore that we struggle to process it all. And pretty much the rest of the season is spent doing just that, grinding out as much ore as we can and using salons to water as many crops as we can. While in the mines, I make sure to kill any rock crabs and shadow shamans I see as well to work towards completing the monster eradication goals, which if you don't know is a metric where you must kill a certain number of each enemy type. This is both an achievement and required for perfection. And make sure to set up this small farm of oak trees and start tapping them whenever a tree grows, as we're gonna need more oak resin than emotional support I need after reading all the comments that say I sound like the nerd emoji. But besides that, it's just more minds grinding. Oh no. Oh, nerds. Oh, what did I drop? Oh, did I drop anything big? Did I drop anything big? Did I drop anything big? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> you know, I think I'll live. Following day, my cauliflower is finished growing, meaning I can finish the spring crops bundle. And I was able to get a crab from the mine, so I can also finish the crab pot bundle. But after that, back to the mine. Now, if you're a fan of Stardew Valley speedruns, you might be wondering why I'm min-maxing this so hard. You see, the fastest way to generally make money in Stardew Valley is just to set up sprinklers and mass sleep until they grow, using the profits to buy more sprinklers and crops, rinse and repeat. Why not just do that if I'm trying to finish this as quickly as possible to meet my contractually obligated deadline? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Firstly, in case you haven't been able to tell by all the other videos on my channel, I have an intense inferiority complex. But the main reason is because of the sheer amount of resources we're gonna need for this run. You see, unless I want to be sitting here until the 2030 release of Haunted Chocolatier, I'm gonna need lots of kegs to bottle lots of wine. Those kegs require me to buy mass amounts of wood, copper, iron, and also coal to turn all that copper and iron into bars. However, after year one, the price of all these resources go up significantly. By banging out all our grinding in the first year, I'll save tons of money in the long run. On spring 24, I harvest my last wave of crops, which thankfully pushes me to farming level 6, allowing me to finally craft those quality sprinklers. And by this point in the season, I had amassed 90 of each type of bar, so I turn them all into sprinklers and start spacing them out for the next season. With my schedule a little bit less crunched now, I make sure to start checking the traveling cart every Friday and Sunday. As a side goal, I want to try and finish the community center in the first year. This is by no means required, but definitely a way to prove to you guys that it's okay that I put the term Stardew Valley Pro in my YouTube titles. There isn't a single community center required fish that's exclusive to spring, but I take the time to catch some of the ones for the lake fish bundle just to get them out of the way and get my fishing level up. And with that, we've now entered summer. And despite having over a hundred sprinklers now, I never thought to, you know, upgrade my hoe. So I'm forced to just use the normal hoe. I then buy all my community center required crops and as many melons as God will allow. I make sure to use my sap to craft some fertilizer that I place on my corn to ensure the five gold star quality ones I need for the community center. After spending the day planting all my melons, the very next morning it's right back to the mines. I also make sure to complete Clint's bulletin board request, asking him to bring me a jade. There are actually two achievements locked behind bulletin board requests. One at 10 requests filled and another at 40. I think in total across my 1,000 hours in this game, I have maybe completed four of these. So safe to say this is gonna be a bit of a struggle. But right now, I just check the board whenever I happen to walk past. And if I do have the item, I go ahead and complete it. I also managed to pick up Dwarf Scroll 3 today, which is actually the most annoying to get out of all four since it's the only one that can't be hoed up and has to be dropped from a monster. This will end up saving me a good amount of grinding. After a string of lucky ladders, I accidentally wind myself up on floor 99, so I figure I might as well head down another floor and grab myself the first of seven star drops. And, uh, wait, what did I put as my favorite thing again? Cut the rope, cutting the rope, oh, um, nom. Um, nom. Omnipotent nom. That's what it stands for. I read that in a book once. That night, I reach combat level 5 and choose fighter for the 10% damage now, but I have plans to change to the other skill path once I hit level 10. That's huge. Oh, that's such a huge pickup. 
That's actually insane. For those unaware, the Slammer is actually the best pre-desert weapon in the entire game, so picking this up is hugely helpful. I continue on down the mines, but make sure to stop at floor 115, as just like the bull that forever ruined my smile, the mines become much harder to survive when you hit its bottom, with all enemies getting a 50% defense buff. On Summer 4, I attempt to get one of the few community center required summer fish, and that goes... So I decided to take a quick stop at Willy's to grab myself a trout soup for the extra fishing level, grabbing a tuna along the way. On summer 5, I decide it's probably about time to upgrade my backpack, as I plan to spend the rest of the day fishing with the sole purpose of increasing my fishing level. This is because I have a league of fish that I need to catch in autumn. Along the way, I managed to fish myself up my 10th unique fish, unlocking the fisherman achievement. The next day, I managed to hoe myself up a dinosaur egg, which inspires me to have the woman I'm too afraid to Google build me a coop for it. But now, it was time to start working on one of Stardew's most daunting achievements, completing the museum's collection. And in order to do that, we're gonna need lots of geodes. And the easiest way to get a ton of geodes is something called geode predicting. But like you guys watching at home, I'm cool and hip and young and swag and also awesome. So I have no idea what that is. But luckily, my nerd friend Blade was kind enough to hop on the phone with me and explain the entire process. You see, similar to the way clay spawns, when your world is generated, it determines what the drops are for every single tile in the mine. For example, this spot right here, if a rock happens to spawn on it, one Omni Geode will always come out, no matter how many times it's been released before. This can be abused by finding one of these Omni Geode rocks on a floor with an elevator. From there, you can go down to the floor, see if the rock spawned, and if not, go back up to floor zero and reset it. I can do this infinitely until I have as many geodes as I want. And while that's nice and all, we can actually take it a step further. You see, what a geode outputs is also determined by your save file C, and will never vary. Meaning that by just plopping our save file into the Stardew Valley predictor, we can determine which order to open up our geodes to get as many minerals as possible with the minimum number of geodes. I know this all sounds really complex, but it's actually quite simple. I just follow this list and crack open whatever geode has Gunther's face on it. And let me tell you, geode farming is some riveting stuff. Thrilling! But after doing this for a few days, by summer 12, we've now donated every single mineral to the museum and unlocked the sewer. Now we still have all the artifacts to worry about, but uh, don't worry, I have a plan for these guys. Just like my plan to ask you guys to subscribe to the Shawnee Dude channel. Chances are, you've probably seen one of my videos before if you got to this point in the video, and you think you're subscribed, but you're not. So why don't you just take a second and click that lovely little subscribe button, because I put out tons of high quality content, and right now I'm working on 100% that took even longer than this one. Dear God, it makes this one look like pancakes. But amassing subscribers wasn't all I got up to these days, as I also managed to bang out a bulletin board request for Smelly Fishman and Incel. And then I try my rod at grabbing myself a sturgeon. Oh my god, please. Come on. I'm so close. Come on. Holy crow. Oh my god. Please, 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 please. I just built a little different, I guess, I say, after four days of trying that straight. <laughs> <laughs> With that taken care of, it's summer 13, and all of the melons I managed to plant on the first night have grown. The timing actually works out pretty perfectly, as I can sell half of this wave to purchase all four vault bundles, and then use the other half to buy a bunch of coal, wood, and stone to craft preserve jars. Now, when the majority of my melons are ready the next day, we can sell these to Pierre for a cool 100,000 gold, unlocking the achievement for earning quarter million in profits. I can then use my fat wad of cash to buy 266 of the best crop in the game, Starfruit. And for all the melons we picked up, we're rewarded with our next achievement, as we hit level 10 farming and of course pick artisan. With the seeds in the ground, the basic frameworks of this run are pretty much set, meaning we can take things a lot easier now. Instead of maximizing efficiency every day, I start sleeping through most of them, as even though we've already been playing for 16 hours, we have barely made a dent into this run. While I sleep through the season, I make sure to check out the bulletin board every single day to finish as many quests as I can. I bang out some easy ones like your mom, I mean bringing George a largemouth bass, killing four lava slimes. With no more sprinklers needed, I change the two chrysalariums I got from the vault in the museum from fire quartz to jade, which we'll trade for staircases later on in the run. Now, if I'm being quite honest, the rest of the season, only a couple things really happened. So to summarize it all, I wrote this little song. I got down to the- Okay, stop. Originally, I did actually have a whole song written here and it recapped like the second half of the season. And then I went to go sing it. The witch came in the night and gave me a void egg. 
Safe to say, I will now be one of six YouTubers who won't be trying to pivot my YouTube channel into a failing music career. But it wasn't all a waste, as I got a lovely email from the people who brought you Guantanamo Bay, who said they'd be happy to take the song off my hands. But let me just speed through everything that the song was gonna say. Hit the bottom of the mines, finish the quality crops bundle, got the galaxy sword, upgrade my axe to steel, and my pickaxe to gold, upgrade my coop, the witch brings me a void egg, and I sell a lot of melon jelly. I also experienced a glitch so strange that despite sending this clip to many Stardew experts, no one could diagnose what's wrong with it. Like, here, watch it entirely uncut. <laughs> nice and simple. All right. Where did the sandfish go? It just uh, vanished? Uh-huh. How? The very last thing I did at the end of the summer gauntlet was fill my coop with two chickens. And all of the animals this run were actually named after real subscribers to the channel. So if you want to have the chance to be more of a disgusting pig than you already are, subscribe right now. Irregardlessly, regardless, on summer 27, all of my star fruit have fully grown and I can start turning them into jelly, as well as place some of them into newly crafted kegs. And with that, summer ends and we say goodbye to the jellyfish. And can I just say, I forgot how truly beautiful this scene was. I love that everyone is just standing alone, staring into the water. It's such a small detail, but it makes it feel like every single villager has been going on their own journey, one that you've just been a small part of. And the music is gorgeous. Makes you feel like you're home, but also somewhere that's totally unfamiliar to you. I know a lot of people are apparently not a big fan of this festival, but god damn, for me, it's everything that is so amazing about Stardew Valley. I fear that I now may have alienated my straight male viewers, so, uh, here's a video of a monster truck crushing a car. Whoa, it's so big. It's the first to fall, and I buy 1,400 pumpkins, but due to time restraints, I'm only able to get about 1,100 of them into the ground, which I'm more than satisfied with. On fall third, the special orders board is put up. If you're like me, you skipped this cutscene, looked at the board once, and thought, that looks hard, and have never looked at it again. So let me explain to you what this board does. The special orders board houses a series of quests that you can complete for each villager that give you special rewards. And while not all of them are required, the reward for most of them is a new items crafting recipe, so safe to say we'll be here a lot. This starts off with a quest from Linus, asking us to clean up the valley by fishing some trash out of the town's beautiful river. And while that sounds all well and good, trash is actually way more common just fishing in this little pond on our farm. So this community cleanup quest actually became more of just a richest man in valley cleans up his pool. But Linus doesn't seem to care very much, and a few days later he sends us the fiber seeds crafting recipe. But one thing I know Linus cares about is the sponsor of today's video, LEGO Fortnite. LEGO Fortnite is a completely new game from the LEGO Group and Epic that swaps out the Battle Royale style gameplay you're familiar with for one more focused on survival, mining, and crafting. It's a survival based game where you gather resources to build structures completely out of LEGO bricks. In my run, I started off by grabbing a bunch of wood and stone so I could start building on my base. I built a village square monument and soon enough I had a walking burger move into my base. From there, we could adventure together and gather some more supplies. The game looks beautiful with the combination of traditional and LEGO brick style graphics. Beef Boss and I continue adventuring. Oh my god! Burger Boss, go! Go, fight! Oh my god, Burger Boss, you messed him up. That was crazy. What is that? What are you? What is this? What is this thing? Whoa. Is this it? I got a llama. Oh my god! Oh my- Oh! From there, we found an abandoned tower, and then a not-so-abandoned tower. Are they friendly? <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. Oh my god, that guy's a gun. Which finally gave us enough supplies to upgrade our base. I built a machine to start processing my woods into planks and had another villager move in. The game is a ton of fun and a must play for all survival fans. And it's completely free. So be sure to check out LEGO Fortnite now, available now on PC and consoles using the link in the description. And thanks again to the LEGO group for sponsoring this portion of the video. I used my new starfruit wine money to buy a bunch of wood that I then used to upgrade my barn twice to the second level as well as repair this bridge. I buy a duck and a cow, but when the Lord giveth, he also taketh away it. As the following day, the traveling cart is selling a white egg, meaning that we must bid farewell to our white chicken. Goodbye, chicken. Thank you for being dead weight. Or at least, that's what I meant to do. But instead, I sold Moondrop the duck, of whom I had literally just bought. And I promise you, I don't think all birds look the same. And I would still definitely love to go bird watching with you if you're watching this, Dad. On fall 10, it starts raining, which means it's a big fishing day. As for some reason, of the 16 required fish you need to catch for 
to the community center, 13 of them can be caught on a rainy day in fall. Like, you could have spread them out a little bit at least, jeez. I managed to catch the catfish, the shad, the walleye, the red snapper, the sardine, the eel, and the bream. Phew! Also along the way, I managed to get two achievements. One for catching 24 different types of fish, and another for just catching 100 fish of any type. But there was one thing I got today that was even greater than everything else before it. <gasps> oh my god, this is such a number one victory royale. Which is very convenient, because later in this run, you'll see we need lots of ancient fruit. Like, a lot. Like, borderline unreasonable amounts of ancient fruit. That night, I reach fishing level 5, and I'm reminded of so many historic figures. Neil Armstrong, George Washington, Amelia Earhart. All of them the first at something. And now, I may finally walk amongst them. As I become the first person to ever pick Trapper. Yes! Who needs money when you have cheap crap hot- what? Oh, this is never gonna come into play the entire run? That makes sense. The following day, I catch myself a tiger trout, and with that, I'm able to complete the fish tank bundle. Special order board has been updated, and Willie wants us to collect 100 pieces of bug meat. I figure I'm best off not asking what he needs that for, though. And honestly, when I saw 100 pieces, I was really intimidated. But by just continually resetting elevator floors, we're already able to accumulate 60 in just half a day. And the next day, you can call us Upton Sinclair, because we're processing loads of meat. I assume that's what happens in that book. Along the way, we grab ourselves the fourth dwarf scroll, allowing us to finally speak with the dwarf, which is particularly impressive considering how hard it is to learn a language at a second age. Hey guys, Sean here. I just, I'm reading through the script right now and I I have no idea why I wrote that like that. Like I'm reading it like, like this is supposed to spin into a transition for a sponsorship with freaking Muzzy or something. Why, why did I write it like that? Not only are we able to complete the special order here, but we're also able to bang out the cave insect monster eradication goal. Oh my, oh my lord. Dear lord. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <gasps> okay. Okay. Okay, this has been a huge day all around. This unlocks the last piece we really need for the community center. In order to grow it, we're gonna need our freshly born goat to produce a large goat milk, as this will finish out the pantry bundle and give us access to the greenhouse where the cabbage can grow. We harvest our wave of pumpkins and then head over to the Stardew Valley Fair as we need to pick up two things here, the rare crow and our second star drop. On Fall 17, we get perhaps the most important special order in the entire game, prismatic jelly. While the premise is pretty simple, we just have to go into the mine and find and kill a rare spawning slime, the importance comes in the reward, the recipe to craft a monster musk. Monster musk is a special item in Stardew that doubles the spawn rate of all enemies. And with the massive amount of monsters we need to slay for this run, getting this as one of our first special orders is extremely lucky. On the 22nd, I decided to do a very minor skeleton caverns run. I'll have to save all my bombs and explosive ammo, as I only have the tiny goal of getting 45 iridium ore today. Five bars for the pickaxe upgrade, and four more bars to build two chrysalariums to speed up the jade duping process. I also make sure to kill any pepper rexes I see on the way down towards their monster eradication goal. But the slammer really starts to show its age here as I get absolutely railed by bats and eels the entire way down, making me chug more salads than the time my mom said I was looking a little pudgy. And by the end of the day, these are my spoils. Pretty lackluster for a skeleton caverns run, but I got more than enough iridium, so I'm happy with it. And with that, I can use my farm warp totem home. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> that is really funny, actually. The next day, I'm offered Clint's special order, which requires me to kill 50 dust sprites, which I take as a sign to finally buy the weapon I'll be using for the rest of this run, the Galaxy Hammer. In case it wasn't obvious how I'm affording all of this, I've been kegging and pickling pumpkins this entire time, and continuing to expand the glorious keg empire as the oak resin rolls in. Before the season ends, I make sure to upgrade my house for the moving up achievement, grab the iridium pickaxe, and harvest one last wave of pumpkins. And while I want to turn most of my pumpkins into juice, I make sure to ship 300 of them first in order to gather the monoculture achievement. It's winter now, so I take the time to fill out some bulletin board requests. Just gotta head to the beach and- Oh, I knew I didn't want to ask about the bug meat. Oh. I'm still waiting on our goat to give us the large goat milk so that we can grow our red cabbage. That's our last missing piece to the community center. And so, completing the community center in this first year is completely out of our hands now. It all comes down to if this milk can give us the goat in time. We spend day in, day out with the only purpose of milking the goat. Well, I actually have an auto grabber, so really it's just sort of this like milk 
suckling machine guzzling on a goat udder. Okay, I think I went too far on this one, guys. In between my daily milkies, I head to Clinton Robbins to use all my pumpkin juice money to buy tons of resources before they raise in price. And I buy a lot, like a lot, like, dear God, that's enough wood, Sean, please stop. And finally, on winter 19, my juicy goat decides to pasteurize up her tubes and give me the delicious milkies. I, I should go to jail for saying that. So I take the milkies over to the community center, finishing out the pantry bundle and unlocking the greenhouse. Then I can plant the red cabbage and it's just a waiting game to see if it'll grow by year's end. It's winter 28 and... Aww. Yep, unfortunately we were just one day late. And while normally this would make me sad that we were just shy of achieving our goal, this was not the point of the video, remember? Look at the runtime! With the community center restored, get your culturally appropriated dreadlocks ready because we're about to become island boys. So after repairing Willie's shop, we're now able to head to Ginger Island, which I plan to make our main base of operations. But before heading down, there's a couple loose ends around Pelican Town we need to tie up. Firstly, we head into the sewers and buy the star drop from Krobus, knocking out our third of seven. We also take the time to finish out the dark talisman quest line, which will give us access to the wizard's magic shop, which we'll need later on. I make sure to upgrade my axe to gold, giving us our final tool upgrade of the run. Lastly, we head to the Adventurer's Guild and buy the Galaxy Dagger, a pair of space boots that we never got because of the remix mines, and a whole stack of explosive ammo for our slingshot. And with all the preparation out of the way, it's time to take our first plunge over to Ginger Island. Now, our first goal here is to unlock the Ginger Island house so we can start building our empire over here. To do that, we're gonna need 31 golden walnuts, but luckily, I'm a Stardew Valley pro, so I remember where they all are. Please pay no attention to the Salmon's tutorial playing on my second monitor. It was at this point that I entered my 25th hour of recording, and while I was passing out in the middle of Ginger Island, the official perfection speedrun was already done. Realizing that unless I wanted to be here until Papa John's Day of Reckoning came, that I would have to get smarter. So I did what any great content creator does when faced with adversity. I stole. But what I did was actually less like stealing and more like borrowing, which is exactly what a thief would say. I took the time to rewatch through Haboo's two videos on completing all Stardew Valley perfection in 24 hours. And seriously, if you haven't watched these videos before, go check them out. What Haboo did here is massively impressive, and his videos are some of my all-time favorites on YouTube. But anyway, back to the summer tending of it all. Haboo in these videos achieves perfection, which isn't everything we have to do. In fact, there's a lot more achievements that perfection doesn't include than you would think, but since we're getting perfection, incorporating some of his techniques to speed up this process will help a ton. First of which is buying lots of crab pots. You see, I was attempting to hook up the crimson fish the other day, but our low fishing level made it completely unreasonable. But harvesting a crab pot earns you five fishing experience points, meaning that if we just lay a ton of these out, we can continue harvesting them to make fish bar big. And fish bar big mean fish so easy catch. The second technique we're gonna illuminati is the crop we're gonna grow on Ginger Island. If you're familiar at all with Stardew Valley Discourse, you know there's two schools of thought on the best crop in the game. Well, I mean, technically there's three, but in this house, we don't respect hop enjoyers. Yes, the age-old debate, star fruit versus ancient fruit. Star fruit is the single highest yield crop in the game, but ancient fruit isn't too far behind, and it's regrowable. But ancient fruit can't be bought. Instead, you must arduously go through the process of picking them, placing them into a seed maker, and planting more, while star fruit can be bought. But while ancient fruit takes longer to get off the ground, once you have a field of them, they grow every seven days, as opposed to star fruits every 14. So with all these different schools of thought, what did Habu go with on his world record run? He decided on ancient fruit. Now with such a controversial choice like this completely invalidating star fruit sucklers, I had to ask Habu what it is that made ancient fruit better. And his response honestly made a ton of sense. He said, I have no idea which one is faster. Now that would be literally an impossible metric to measure. I just went with my gut. Cool! Well, that means we can grow whichever one we want, so I decided to dedicate my crop field to your mom because she's so dang ancient. With the crop choice all locked and loaded, it's time to move all of our chests, as well as our keg empire over to the island. Then it's time to go into this cave and play Simon Says with these rocks. But surely with six hours left in the day, there's no way I don't finish this, right? R right? Right. I'm surprised you think so low of me. Like for real, even though I'm a YouTuber. Oh my, are you joking? Are, are you f Bro, I'm I'm tilted. I'm really tilted. I can't lie. I'm like so tilted. That was so much. <sighs> okay, it's okay. It's okay. After getting out my aggression the same way the United States does, arriving to a beautiful land I know nothing about and bombing the ever little hell out of it, I can go back to the Simon Says minigame once again and oh, you gotta be kidding me. The next morning I can go back a third 
time. And finally collect Simon's walnuts and unlock the island farmhouse. With that taken care of, we're off to Skeleton Caverns as in order to finish this run, we're gonna need a good amount of things from there. The rarest of which being an auto pet. I've traded all the jade I've been duping for this entire run for staircases, having now accumulated 374 of them. Using these, I can mass climb down floors, searching for treasure rooms. However, the auto petter is pretty rare at a 3.8% chance. But that's fine, as the auto petter isn't the only reason we're here. We also need to grab a ton of iridium ore and a good amount of prismatic shards. I'm mostly just checking floors, seeing if they have iridium, and if not, using a ladder. While I don't get the auto petter, I do manage to gather around 800 iridium ore, 12 prismatic shards, and tons of other ore types. However, just when I'm prepping to leave, you... <sighs> Please, please, nothing big, please, nothing big, please, 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 please. Okay, that's workable. That's fine, that's fine. Okay, well that didn't go as good as we wanted, but I ran out of salads, there wasn't really too much I could do. With my spoils I earned from this dive though, the following Thursday I can trade all my rubies for spicy eel, my diamonds for triple shot espressos, and most importantly, three prismatic shards for a magic rock candy. Which if you don't know is the best food buff in the game, giving a whopping one speed, five attack, five luck, and some other stats that don't matter. But unlike Captain Sparkles, we are not getting out of the mines today, as it's time to grind out one of the other most important items of this run, the Burglar's Ring. The Burglar's Ring is the reward you get for finishing the Dust Sprite Monster Eradication goal. and it does doubles each monster item's drop rate. And before you leave a snarky comment on the burglar ring actually having a slightly different effect, I know, it's just easier to explain it the way I did. So go ahead, just delete your comment. Come on. I'll wait. The reason the burglar ring is so important is really just because you need tons of monster drops to get every achievement. I need bat wings for the pounds of monster musks I'm going to be making later on. I need geodes for carbon ghosts, dragon's tooth, cinder shards, the list goes on. So it's vital to get this before we start doing our volcano dive. After around a half a day of elevator resetting for dust sprites, I'm able to finish the goal and grab myself the all valuable ring. Then I go ahead and bang out the pirate's locket fetch quest. You know, I always found this quest pretty funny because everyone gets these super nice and uplifting gifts like Gus uh, gets new cooking salt, and Sandy gets a beautiful rose, and then Kent gets trauma. Also, I got the trash can hat. Look at me. With that done, my current overarching goal is to wait for my ancient fruit to grow, so I can put them into the seed maker and cover my entire farm in ancient fruit. Since I'm going to be sleeping a lot and have my farm open, I decide now is a perfect time to work towards two different achievements. Every season, I'm going to buy 25 of each crop and grow them here. The first achievement that this will help with is polyculture, which requires you to ship 15 of every single crop. And the second reason is just to cook every recipe, so having some leftovers will give us well beyond the required ingredients for this run. With those all planted, it's time to sleep until the ancient fruit have grown. While I'm mass sleeping, I steal another technique from the almighty Habu and make Mondays my go-out day, as that's the day the special orders board resets. I do all my errands on this day, like check the bulletin board, refill my crab pots, bet on the ponies, you get the point. I take Demetrius' special order this week, as he's one of the few characters that actually has two different quests to get his item. One has you trying to get 10 of a very specific fish, while the other one has you catch 20 fish from a specific location. The specific fish is way harder, so I I'd been pushing it off any time it had been offered to me, but this time I can just grab my fishing pole and finish this in just a couple in-game hours. Then it's time for our first dive into the volcano dungeon. There's like so many things that we need from here, so I need not explain them all, but the main ones are the semi-rare dragon teeth for the obelisk, cinder shards for enchantments, and killing 150 magma sprites for the eradication goal. Speaking of the magma sprites, they might just be God's worst creation. I hate how they move, I hate how they're so hard to hit, I hate how much health they have, I hate that they don't show up in skull caverns, you are a leech on to society magma sprites. They're actually the whole reason I got the galaxy dagger in the first place. Because it's rapid fire secondary attack makes taking them out much easier. But note, I didn't say easy. Yeah, the dive starts to make me realize the lack of enchantments in general on my tools. As my galaxy hammer struggles to take out enemies. I do manage to grab a good 35 cinder shards from this run and a dragon's tooth, which is a great start. It turns autumn, so with my increased fishing level from all the crab potting I've been doing and the fact that the angler is the nepo baby of the legendary fish, I'm able to easily catch it. This experience pushes me over over the edge, giving me fishing level 10, which is good because, oh my god, I was getting so sick of filling those crap pots. Oh my god, how does anybody like this mechanic? Following Monday, we get a new quest on the special orders board. Island ingredients. And Caroline wants us to collect 100 ginger. Well, that shouldn't be so hard. Just, uh, okay, not a single piece of ginger spawned on our entire farm. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna wait for this quest to say tarot root. But as I refuse the quest, in the background, I could hear a small laugh. A laugh filled with malice. But it's probably nothing. Next up, we have a special order from Rob and he wants us to collect a thousand wood. But honestly, collecting a thousand wood in a week sounds kind of tough, so I'm not really sure. 
And with that, fall is over and I can ship out my polyculture crops. But once I go over to the mainland, I see that Kent wants a bok choy. Okay, I'll head back to the island. I've got one of those in the fridge. Then I use my newly built farm warp obelisk and uh, yeah, still forgot to move those. After finally remembering to move the barn, since I'm already here, I decide to go and catch the glacier fish. I mean, I've got level 10 fishing now. Should be a piece of cake, right? Well, yes. If that cake was forged with dog feces and baked in the center of the sun, this was far and away the biggest challenge I had in the entire run. Not the octopus, not the lava eel, not even the legend. The glacier fish single-handedly almost made me stop this entire video. Now, for context, despite playing video games being pretty much the thing I've done the most in my entire life, besides maybe pooping, I never get angry at them. In fact, in my entire life, I've only really gotten mad at three video games. Mario Party 8, and I was losing, so I shut the Wii off with a right remote. This horrible section in Little Nightmares, and a League of Legends game where someone was so mean to me, I did the thing that I've done most in my life in my pants. But due to a variety of factors that I won't bore you with the details on, the entire 70 hour playthrough need to be recorded in six days. Now this is on top of a bunch of other work I needed to get done, so in total I was probably running on four hours of sleep for an entire week. So by day four, where we are now, I was just a shell of a human, glued to my computer screen, drool falling down the side of my face. You know in old cartoons when someone would like open up their wallet and be empty and it just go <laughs> That's what my skull felt like. So that's the scene set when I go into starting my journey to fish for the glacier fish. It was also two in the morning at the time. I set my line out and wait for the fish to come in. Now I actually did a tier list of every single fish in Stardew Valley two years ago and I remember putting glacier fish pretty low. So imagine my shock when I try reeling in the very first glacier fish but I don't get even closer close. Well, you know, that pattern actually kind of seemed impossible, so maybe it was just a bad pattern. Let's try again. After a couple of casts, I managed to fish him up once again, and while I get further this time, he seems to bolt around so erratically that there's no way to track him. But I start to see that he does always go straight up at the beginning and then straight down, and as long as you can get that rhythm down, eh, it should be easy. I hook another one, and uh, how are you supposed to track that? I could feel myself bubbling with rage. Pure anger built from my lack of sleep and, frankly, too much coffee are all being projected onto this stupid fish. How could I ever catch that? It just goes up and down whenever it wants. Okay, calm down, Sean. Let's just get it on the line again. Oh, okay, here it is, and... That was even shorter than last time! And I know it doesn't seem like much, but see this little movement I do after losing it? That was just my pure rage coming out in the only way I could manifest it. Random flailing, like I'm a freaking Muppet. I start looking through my crafting menu. There must be something here that could help me. Uh, could one of these bobbers help or something? I spend the next 10 minutes trying until finally things seem to be going right. The more and more I tried, the more I realized that I was using the max upgraded rod. I had fishing level 10 and I was using bait. The problem did not lie within the glacier fish. The problem lied within myself. Despite playing Stardew for so many hours and make videos about it on this channel for two years, I was completely out of touch. None of my videos really revolved around fishing. I was washed up. Are people even going to care about my 100% video at all? I mean, hell, Habu completed in 24 hours and in Blade Seated Run, he completed in just 19 hours flat. What could I, a guy who couldn't even catch the glacier fish, add to this conversation? I take my rod to the lake and easily catch the rare midnight carp, but I feel nothing. I am numb, brain broken, heart empty as I trudge home. But as I sulk home, I hone in on the majestic music of the valley and am reminded of the lesson this game has instilled in me time and time again. Life doesn't always need to have a grand meaning. It's not about being the greatest of all time. Sometimes it's just about enjoying the beauty that is is life. Leah's still not the world's most accomplished artist. Penny only teaches a class of two children. Alex isn't going to be a professional grid ball player. There can be a happiness in working towards a dream at your own pace and not immediately becoming a machine trying to maximize your time and profit. So who cares if it takes me 10 more years to get perfection than anyone else? Who cares if I can't show off to you how amazing of a fisherman I am? What I lost was not my fishing skills, but it was the morals of the valley itself. And hey, after remembering all that and casting my line out again, I felt at peace. And even though it took a couple tries, come on, come on, yes! Oh my god, first attempt after getting the trapper bobber. I, I'm gonna to sashimi and feed you to the. Are you 
blob of a fish. I hate you so much. Oh my god. But despite my outburst, I still had grown so much as a person. So I decided to take on one of the other most difficult fish in this run, the ice pip. Now, while the ice pip isn't as difficult to catch as the glacier fish, the chances of actually hooking it up are only around 6%. So if you mess it up, you're going to be sitting there for a while. Like I sat there for a good nine real world minutes before hooking one up and immediately failing. But in every failure, there's a beautiful success. As immediately after I head over to the submarine, I'm able to instantly hook up all of the usually quite difficult submarine fish. And hey, I'm in luck as Caroline has put up the island ingredient special order again. And this time she's requesting taro root. Unfortunately, I only have 43 taro tubers. But if I buy deluxe speed grow from Sandy, I can just barely get two waves in. I can then seed maker the first wave to make way for the second one and give that to Caroline. While I wait for Sandy to open though, I figure I might as well put a little dent in my giant stack of staircases and look for the auto petter again. I pop my magic rock candy to increase my luck and start spamming staircases. And then on floor 216, Nice, nice, that is nice. That's really nice. And in conclusion, that was very nice. After buying the deluxe speed grow from Sandy, I plant my batch of tarot tuber down. With all that planted down, it was time to do some enchantments on my tools. And just like geodes, the order of enchantments can be predicted, meaning that I know exactly the order to enchant my tools to get everything perfect. On my hammer, I put artful because like, duh. And for the dagger, I actually, once again, stole Haboo's strategy and put Crusader on it for a reason I'll explain later. Ooh, something to look forward to. You better not click off the video. There's gonna be so many any surprises. It's like the Christmas Eve of extremely niche Stardew Valley explanations. Lastly, for now, I get powerful on my pickaxe to dig through the harder rocks of the skeleton caverns. Eventually, I'm able to enchant my hoe to archaeologist, which increases the chances of a hoeing up artifacts, my fishing rod to autobite, enchant my hammer with as many rubies as I can. While I'm here, I decide to try my hand at fishing up the lava eel. Now, remember that fishing tier list I mentioned earlier? I actually ranked lava eel as the hardest fish in the entire game, so I timidly throw my line into the lava and instantly lose the fish. But then, on my very next attempt, something amazing happens. No way. No way. No way! You're joking. You're actually joking. Are you serious? Second attempt? It took me two freaking days to get the glacier fish? But I hooked the lava eel in two attempts. Are we actually being serious right now? Be so real with me. A couple days later, my taro root has finally grown. Now, with the planting process here, I have to be very careful. You see, for some genius reason, I only bought exactly 100 deluxe speed grow from Sandy, and she only sells it on Thursdays. And all the taro root needed to be planted exactly today, or they won't be ready in time for the end of the quest. And with my ever-growing ancient fruit empire ever so slightly inching into the taro root's turf, if I even place one down in the wrong location, it'll mess everything up. But I don't actually mess up in that way. I actually mess up in a completely different way. You see, I wasn't counting the exact number of taro tubers the seed maker was giving me and accidentally turned too much into tuber. This completely eliminated my buffer if I, I don't know, for some reason I accidentally miscounted and was just too tarot root away that I accidentally put inside of a keg. And once again, I heard the laughing, an insidious laugh. The laugh of a woman whose one dream was relegated to one disgusting back room. And even though that's pretty specific, I could be talking about anybody. Point is, we'll have to wait for Caroline to offer this quest again. Grandpa comes down and asks if he left the oven on and I plant our batch of 25 spring crops. Head back over to the island and decide to take the time to bang out the remaining nuts, as that's, of course, a perfection requirement. I go to get the five random ones you get from fishing, but I manage to hook something else up. What the hell is this? Is this an octopus? Is this a freaking octopus? Am I about to lose an octopus? Hardest fish in the game, my behind. My behind. And yeah, that was a good time for my tackle to wear out. Wow. Wow, I feel incredible right now. I can't believe I just caught that, like, easily. Yes, that was me easily catching what the Stardew Valley Wiki describes as the hardest fish in the game. So maybe I actually take back all the stuff I said before, and I do actually want everyone to compliment my gameplay skills. After securing those walnuts, I run around the island grabbing some of the easier nuts until I've only got a couple of the involved ones remaining. Speaking of those involved nuts, I free Professor Snail from the cave and answer his stupid easy questions. Like, Mr. Bones, why'd you put these test questions on Quizlets? Like, you know I'm gonna look them up. Then it was off to the volcano dungeon as 17 different walnuts can be found here through mining or killing enemies. I do 
manage to get a whopping four dragon's teeth in one run though, give me close to a third of the, all the ones I need for this entire playthrough. By this point, my field of ancient fruit has fully grown so I can start kicking it as we're gonna need like 15 million gold for this run, which equates to around 6,500 ancient fruit wine. So we got a lot of sleeping to do. I do another volcano run and manage to get the rare golden walnut chest, as well as a pair of mermaid boots that I'll be wearing for the rest of this run. I show the fat frog the garlic I grew and rebuild the resort, unlocking Ginger Island East. And after gathering some more walnuts, we finally hit 100 and unlock Mr. QI's walnut room. I wonder how much perfection progress we've made. I literally want to die. I check the QI board and the quest that unlocks the hard mode version of the mines is active, but only if we can get all the way from floor one to floor 120. And it's due by the end of the day. Luckily, this is why we have staircases so we can easily chug through. Getting this quest early is really nice as way more enemies spawn in this version of the mines, which makes farming the monster eradication goals much easier. As long as you're, you know, not a little baby. With my farm set up and the walnut room open, call me a beauty because there's gonna be a ton of sleeping now. Just waking up on Mondays to harvest our ancient fruit, wine it, check the special orders board, and also the QI board. Luckily, very soon after, we managed to get the hard mode skeleton caverns quest as well. So I chug a monster musk and start working on slaying as many serpents, mummies, bats, slimes, and rock crabs as I can. And with the musk up, the floors start to get pretty hectic. I mean, this is floor seven. This was another huge reason we wanted the burglar ring equipped, as ghosts in the dangerous caverns have a 99% chance to drop omni geodes, meaning nearly everyone killed will give two geodes. Eventually, I'm able to kill all 100 mummies needed for the monster eradication goal, and shift my focus to serpents, and I head home for the day with a full 95 omni geodes. After some more kegging, I manage to get Emily's rock rejuvenation request, and go to easily bang that one out. But when I give her the amethyst, because Sergeant Red Pill asked me to give her one, that quest takes priority, meaning I don't finish the special order. So I gotta go all the way back and grab another one. Though in Clint's defense, he is sigma pilled and doesn't think about things like this. With most of our skeleton caverns work done, I swap out the crystallariums for rubies to trade for more spicy eels. After learning that panning can be predicted, I plot my save file into the predictor and find a time to grab a fossilized tail. Meaning the only pieces I'm missing now are the fossilized skull and the snake vertebrae, which can be hoed up on the island farm. I'll periodically take screenshots of the farm to see if any artifact spots pop up to farm it, but we can't do much to ensure it outside of that. I take the end of summer to work towards the eradication goals for the shadow shamans, bats, and slimes, and end up completing the shadow shaman. That night, I finally remember to change my combat skills, this time choosing acrobat. As combined with artful, this means I can do a secondary hammer attack nearly non-stop, which comes in handy as the following day, I finish the Duggies, Bats, and Skeletons eradication goals, and just look at how many bone swords I got, like Christ in a cat. And since tonight's the Dance of the Moonlight Jellies, I make sure to attend and buy a seafoam pudding from Pierre, as this gives you plus four fishing, which will ease in catching some of the final harder fish we have left. And speaking of fish, the next day, I had the single longest scorpion carp of all time. I mean, look at this, it's still somehow going. While I'm here, I make sure to grab beets and rhubarb seeds, as they're the last seeds I'm missing for polyculture. That night, I head over to the Pirate's Cove and play darts, which compared to Ikechi's Persona 5 quest, this was nothing, though the lack of romantic tension was severely missed. I hate you. I also make sure to grab the stingray while I'm here. I take all the omni geodes I found, and using the predictor, I'm able to grab the last of the museum donations, bar the two strange dolls, which I still need the secret notes for. The golden coconut also gave me a banana sapling, which is the last piece I need to craft the island obelisk. That'll take a little bit to grow. Meaning I still gotta rely on Willy's boat. Oh my god, I wish to be rid of this thing so badly. But after sailing over, I fish over some remaining fish in the mutant carp, the slime jack, the void salmon, and the ice pit. While the ice pit was giving me trouble before, I chugged my seafoam pudding and equipped a curiosity lord to increase the odds that I hooked it up, making literally my first catch a success. While in town, I also spent two million gold on the return scepter to instant teleport me home. This was probably unnecessary. In fact, it was definitely unnecessary and probably added another hour to my playtime. But in the words of John McAfee, what's the point in being rich if you can't amass a bunch of expensive doodads to flex on the poor? I again offered the hard mode skeleton caverns quest again, so I head there to grind out the remaining monster eradication goals. Oh, nice, another one. That day, I managed to eradicate all of the rock crabs, all of the pepper rexes, and all of the carnal thoughts I have about Nick Wilde from Zootopia. On winter second, I find an infested floor on floor 21 of the mine, meaning I can continually reset it by just going down from floor 20. This allows me to add slimes to the eradication. And while trying to complete Mr. Key's keto challenge, I add serpents to that list as well, leaving just magma sprites. Upon arriving home, Settler offers me a special order again, but it's still with Ginger. Why do you hate me, girl? I it's not my fault you married the root of all evil. All of that monster killing, though, gave us the rest of the secret notes, meaning we can quickly hoe up the strange dolls, finishing the museum, and grab our fifth of seventh star drop. While I'm over in town, I buy the island, earth, and water obelisk, though I have to wait for my cacti to grow before I can buy the last one. I keep up doing volcano grinds until finally...
Oh my god, that's so good. My monster must just run out. Just ran out. And I did not want to craft another one. Oh, that's huge, Pogs. I was eating dinner. Holy crap. Oh my god. I've been eating ramen. I just had like the last bite. Oh my god. It's so freaking hot. Oh my god. Show on screen what kind of ramen I'm eating. Oh my god. This is so hot. And I have no water down here. But I need to get this video done. I refuse to get water. Which finishes off the last of the monster eradication goals. I'm sure you can tell by now, but we just got a bunch of loose ends to tie up before getting to the next big task. So I'm gonna rapid fire them at you. I catch the legend, give the banana to the monkey. This is the best game ever. He pooped out a walnut. What could be freaking better than this, man? Get the fossilized skull, buy the last of Mr. Key's recipes, craft a bunch of items, plant a ton of spring seeds to increase my foraging level, catch the Dorado, and then the Crimson Fish, which was the last fish I needed to catch, giving me the Master Angler achievement and also the second to last star drop from Willy. Caroline offers me the Terra Root version of our quest finally, which I'm sure you've noticed I've pre-planted on my farm this whole time, leaving just one remaining special order. I ship the last of the crops we need for the Polyculture achievement, I make all of the money we need for the rest of the rum, bomb the ever-living heck out of my farm, and build the Golden Clock. Phew! That was a ton, but luckily that is nearly everything we needed to do in this run. W well, except for you. I I'm getting to you. But now it's time to address the elephant in the room. Why we don't have any friends. And the reason is because men are often encouraged by societal pressures to not be sensitive. Leading to a lack of emotional connections in your life. And also, I fought a lot and I am so, so stinky PU. But in terms of my Stardew Valley character, it's because I've been saving them all until now. And while you might think it'll take thousands upon thousands of gifts to max our friendship with every single character, that's where the auto petter comes in. You See, if we fill our coop with a bunch of rabbits, with the auto petter going on in three silos filled with hay, we can just sleep for a couple years, and the rabbits will be at maximum happiness and produce iridium quality rabbits feed. Rabbits feed are a universal love, and combined with the iridium quality, giving one on someone's birthday gives 960 friendship points, or just around four friendship hearts. So just like I did after my depressive episode in college, we sleep for several years straight. When we awake, we've amassed a whopping 142 iridium rabbits feed. Then it was time to just go around and give every single person in the valley four feet. Now instead of just going through this all, I thought it'd be fun to throw every single villager in a tier list based on how annoying they are to give them a gift on their birthday. You know, based off how far they live, what time you have to wait for, etc. And this list is assuming you don't have two hearts with them, but you do have the key to the town. Okay, ready? Three. Two, one, go. Jody A tier. She starts washing dishes at the crack of dawn, loses points for traditional gender roles. Abigail C tier. She wakes up late and also I'm still mad that her love gifts is pumpkins and her birthday is one day away from before your pumpkins and possibly grow. Sandy B tier. The oasis opens at nine. Robin B tier. 8 a.m. Wake up, but your birthday shouldn't be on a Sunday as that's the Lord's day. George S tier. Wakes up right at six and I get to look at Alex on the way. Provis S plus tier. Perfect little small bean whose politics I don't want to hear based off his view on the dwarf war. Minus S tier. Caroline F tier. She just stares at you like, leave the room. Why must you taunt me? Sebastian. D tier. He wakes up at 3, but this character is based off concern for himself, and I'm still trying to secure a haunted chocolate tier early access. RV B tier. Wizard A tier. Wakes up at 6, but lose points for being in love with the beast that is Caroline. Evelyn S plus tier. Leah Shadow Realm tier. She wakes up at 4 p.m. to head to the bar, and they say Shane is the depressed one? Clint S tier, who never leaves the counter because Emily has filed a restraining order against him. Kent A tier. I have no idea what time he wakes up, but he shares a bedroom with Jody, so I never had to find out. Louis A tier. Vincent B tier. Haley C tier. Pam S tier for making me feel good about also starting my drinking at 6 a.m. Shane B tier. He usually is the earliest riser in the game, but it rained on his birthday, so I had to wait. Pierre S tier. Emily C tier. Also, if Emily's best girl to you, you either need to watch more or less Steven Universe. I'm not sure which. Jazz C tier. Gus B tier, who loses points because he's visiting Pierre. Maru D tier. Alex A tier. Sam also Shadow Realm tier because I spent the whole day looking for him, and it turned out that he was at the Ginger Island Resort, and also he's a Joe Shill. Demetrius B tier because he wakes up at 6, but I still can't get over the tomato thing, man. Like, come on! Tomato is not a fruit, you stupid nerd. Dwarf S tier. How they have not produced a hoodie that looks like his head will never fail to elude me. Willie A tier, just because I'm still scared from the meat scene. Penny is in G tier for go to hell because she's the only character who doesn't love rabbit's feet, so I had to grow freaking melons for her. The rabbits like giving us their feet, Penny. What don't you understand about that? And lastly, Elliot E tier for Elliot. And that was just one year of gift giving, so we need to do that three more times because of friendship decay. And oh my god, this took so, so long. Like, Jesus. This, this might be the most time consuming part of the entire run. But finally, after years of giving out feet. Oh my god. Skip this stupid scene. Please. We're finally done. Of course, I remember your birthday, Elliot. Holy crap. Look at this. We finally finished. Oh my god. This took way longer than I thought it was going to. This was so much freaking sleeping. Holy crow. Oh my.
Okay, okay, so what happened was the birthday guide I was looking at was from before Leo was added to the game. So now we gotta sleep another four years to befriend him. Awesome. Great thinking, Shawnee. But I decided to save that for the end of the run. For now, there are two things that happened in the Great Gifting Saga. Firstly, we finished the missing bundle because while not required, feels like it should be. Also, by completing a bulletin board request to give Harvey a refined quartz, we finished off our 40th and final required help wanted quest, giving us a big help achievement. And with that, we've got just a couple main achievements left. Crafting every item, upgrading our house, getting married to get the last star drop, shipping every item, and cooking every recipe. And yep, that's it. Definitely no more. Upgrading the house is easy, and for the shipment, we just had to track down some tea leaves. Throughout the gifting years, I had crafted pretty much everything. I just needed to upgrade my house again to have the seller giving me the cask recipe, and thusly the achievement for crafting every item. Now, I couldn't cook every recipe until I befriended Leo, so I decided it was time to get sleeping again. But before we did that, we had to get married. And if you're a longtime fan of the channel, you probably already know who we're marrying. Yeah... You know I was gonna come back for him. I cannot remember the last time I've seen Alex in the marriage outfit. I've seen pretty much everybody else but him. But despite that, I was still really excited for the day. My brain is literally filled with mucus. Did I mention I was running on four hours of sleep yet? And regardlessly, I give Alex a bunch more bunny feet and get the last star drop in the game. But by marrying Alex here, I kind of made an oopsie. You see, in order to befriend Leo, I need to give him four rabbit's feet, meaning I have to sleep for four more years. My thought was that in that time I had to sleep for Leo, I could trigger both child adoptions to get the full house achievement. However, what I didn't consider is that once you marry somebody, their decay per day, if you don't talk to them, goes from minus two to minus ten. So by the time I had slept to maxing Leo, Alex was less than happy with me. Leo should be maxed out now. Holy crap. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Oopsie. And not only is my marriage now falling apart, but in order to achieve perfection, you have to max hearts with every single NPC. And even though I used to have 14 hearts with Alex, since I lost it, perfection won't trigger. So after cooking up the recipes that Leo sent me and completing all of the cooking achievements, getting Alex's friendship up is the final step. But after around 20 minutes of gifting... Wait, wait. The legacy of the farm is eternal. He's beaming at me? Oh, is Alex at eight hearts? Oh, is that satisfactory? Oh, oh my god, did I do it? Guys, I don't know if I said this in the video already, but I've never seen this cutscene. Somehow, like, in a hundred hours of Stardew. I can't believe I just said a hundred hours of Stardew, and then like a thousand hours of Stardew. And this cutscene coming out like four years ago now? I've avoided spoilers on this cutscene for so long. This is genuinely the first time I'm ever gonna see it. Do I really want to do it in winter though? Let's do it in spring. <laughs> Here it is. Oh my gosh, Alex is there. Despite how much he probably hates us at this point. <laughs> hey Shoney. This is so exciting. Great view, huh? I, I seriously can't believe I've this has never been spoiled for me. I was just thinking about the last 15 years. It's been 15 years? Oh my god. No, it has, hasn't really. I finally discovered who I want to be, and I feel certain about the future. Oh, Alex. I don't think I would have gone here without you, Shoney. I know you wouldn't have. I kind of I, I kind of did all the work to unlock this place, but, but it's okay. Oh, so sweet. Oh, <gasps> the Moonlight Jelly song. No, <gasps> Krobus. Oh, <gasps> the dwarf. Wait, are they getting along now? Oh, 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 the wizard supervising. Wait, did he make up with the witch? Oh my God, are they together again? It's been a long road. <laughs> You're telling me. You challenged yourself to reach the summit. What an accomplishment. We've been watching every step of the way. And you've made us very proud. Aww. <laughs> Grandpa, give him the thumbs up. Aww. That's so cute. 
So yes, with perfection completed, it was time to now focus on Vector's Challenge. In case you're lucky enough to not know about this achievement, Vector's Challenge requires you to beat all of the arcade game Journey of the Prairie King without dying once. And since you die in one hit, it really means don't ever get hit. And this is far and away the hardest achievement in the game. In fact, this might be the hardest achievement in any game I've ever played. I mean, look at how many enemies are on the screen right now. It's 15 straight levels of twin stick shooting hell. Having to properly manage resources, money, and enemies leading to just a 0.2% completion rate. So ready for a long dive, I took to my stream and start my attempts of the agonizing Fector's Challenge. Now the first level starts off pretty easy with just a few enemies that I can all kill in one hit. But it's not all daisies here as it's super important for us to secure 15 coins. This is because at the end of the second level, we'll be offered a shop and we need to be able to afford the damage upgrade. So after resetting the first level a couple of times, I managed to secure nine coins, nearly guaranteeing the upgrade. But after fighting through the second level, we end up with just 14 coins, one away from the upgrade, making this whole run a wash. Or is it? You see, now's about the time I tell you that everything I said about Vector's challenge before was a complete lie. You see, the completion percentage was just 0.2% until the 1.5 update, when it suddenly skyrocketed up to 1.2%. So what happened? Well, in attempts to make the game more accessible, Concerned Ape added a feature that allows you to save your game of Prairie King between levels. And if you come back the next day, you can pick up from where you left off. So we can abuse this by sleeping every time we beat a level. And then if we get hit, we reset the day and retry. This makes our full run deathless, even though we technically died a few times. This strategy is generally referred to as save scumming. And if you consider this cheating, I do not care. This achievement is so bad that Concerned Ape says he regrets putting it in the game. So I feel no guilt at all in cheesing it. After a couple more resets, I managed to finish the level with 16 coins and secure the damage upgrade. Now the third and fourth levels are probably the ones I reset the most, as to be able to finish this run, we're gonna need all the damage upgrades as well as one fire rate upgrade, costing a whopping 85 coins. So it's really important that we get a good start here so as not to soft lock us later. Eventually, I managed to get a run that picks up 30 coins in just two levels, which for this stage in the game is huge. I go with the second damage upgrade and move on to the boss of the first world. It's a shootout style mini game where you have to hide behind cover and then shoot at him once he gets tired. My huge amount of damage makes this a breeze and we move on to world two. Now world two complicates things by adding two new enemy types, the ogre that takes more hits and the butterfly who can fly and is pretty fast. Luckily, my 1300 hours in the Binding of Isaac have prepared me for this moment and I'm able to weave through them and get the 10 coin run on my very first attempt. This lets me buy the fire rate upgrade, which makes the rest of this world much easier. I do die though once to just generally being overwhelmed. At the next shop, I decide to skip and save my money for the damage upgrade. And then it's on to the next boss who goes down just as easily as his brother. And with that, we're on to the last world. In Skull world, there are only two enemy types, the slow moving mummies and the speedy flying demons. The mummies have high health, but our damage upgrades allow us to shred through them. But the speed of the demons is extremely dangerous. I reset the level once to try and get more coins, but after fighting through it again, things are looking quite grim with only 34 coins. Give me a nickel. Oh my god, it actually worked! <laughs> oh my god, that was awesome! See, you just have to ask nicely, guys. That's the difference between me and most people who play this game. That was actually sick. <laughs> I secure the second fire rate upgrade, and after playing through the next two, it's time for the final level of the game. Here, we need to get 11 coins, the star power up, and not die, which is easier said than done when the level looks like this. But despite getting the coins on the very first attempt, there's no star to be found. Star! Oh my god, at the last second. Holy crow! Oh my gosh! That was awesome, actually! We grabbed the final damage upgrade, and now it was time to face Fector himself. And the final boss of this twin stick shooter is no doubt one of the hardest in the game, right? Well, yes, he's extremely difficult. That's why we brought the star power up, because it lets us unload so many rounds into him and kill him nearly instantly. This secures us the Fector's challenge achievement, and also the last achievement in Stardew Valley. <gasps> oh my god! Yeah! <sighs> Oh my god. Wow. I only, it only took me like an hour and a half. That was pretty good. 
I thought this was gonna take me like a 10 hours, like at least. Playing all the way through Stardew Valley again, it made me realize something. This is the way I enjoy playing the game. Trying to maximize every single second of the game as much as I can, but having the time to take it all in. I haven't played Stardew without some challenge or twist since probably 2018. And I'm sure you guys could probably all tell that at some points in the past two years of my channel, I've gotten really burnt out on it. Like, really burnt out. Like, never wanting to pick it up again. But playing this way, with no pressure to get a video out, just for fun? It reminded me of why I even fell in love with this game in the first place. The charm of each monster, the details in each NPC's dialogue, the incredibly built-out worlds, and the way it feels like it expands far beyond this little town. You're just peering into one small part of it. In the music! How could I forget this music? You got... <laughs> It's like you had this best friend, but you haven't seen them in a while. The only way you guys really interact is seeing their life through Instagram. You see they've got new friends, they listen to new music, play new video games. You text them once in a while, but things feel completely different. You're not sure what to talk about, and you feel like they have this totally different life outside you. But then you see them in person again, and it's like nothing ever changed. You talk for hours, you still feel the warmth and love that you've always had for them. And despite seeing you every single day, god damn, I missed you, Stardew Valley. I forgot how many times you were there for me. How many times I felt like when nothing else in my life was working, I could come back to you. Gus, Willie, Robin, Louis, Leah, Abigail, Leo, Alex. I was viewing you all for so long as just set pieces. Ones to make jokes about or obstacles to recipes. As stupid as this is to say, this playthrough made me realize all of these people were my friends. Except you, Pierre, you know what you did. I'm not really sure the point I'm trying to make here other than Stardew Valley has captured a magic that no other game I've played in my entire life has. And that magic has helped me form who I am and God damn, it wouldn't be the same without it. So thank you, Concerned Ape, for gifting the world this masterpiece. And thank you to Stardew Valley for being the best friend this washed up 25 year old gamer could ask for. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Wait. Um, wh why isn't the video ending? And why is there still so much runtime left in the video? No, 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 don't tell me! Don't tell me there's more! To complete the Joja Co. Member of the Year achievement, we're gonna have to create a completely new save file, since we've already picked the Community Center path on our main file. And to complete this as fast as possible, we're just gonna use the technique that they use in the Joja Percent speedrun. So to do this, we're gonna have to use our friend from all the way back from the beginning of the run, Clay Farming. Except this time, instead of hoeing up clay, I sleep until winter. From here, I can use the same technique to hoe up Snowy M in winter root, which so far much more than clay. And so after just 10 days of this, we're able to gather all 140,000 G and buy the last of the Joja community development projects and grab the true last achievement, Joja Co. Member of the Year. Kind of a weird note to end on, right? Like this ending is pretty antithetical to the entire point of Stardew Valley. Selling out the town just to get a fake achievement. Wow, this is pretty dark. Uh, here's a video of my dog trying on his hiking shoes for the first time. Carly, come here. <laughs> So, um, hope that helped. Please subscribe. Please. Thanks to the LEGO Group for sponsoring today's video.